The Lord be with you. Good morning and a warm welcome to all. Special welcome to our guests and visitors joining us today. Good to have you here and also those joining us online. My name is Glenn Schlecht. I'm the senior pastor here at Emmanuel. This morning we are wrapping up our winter epiphany series called Epiphanized and getting ready to move into the next season, but more about that a little bit later. But today we are going to be focusing on this wonderful, mysterious, powerful event that's called Transfiguration. We're going to hear about that both in the second reading from Second Peter, this first-hand account of what he has to say, and then from Matthew's account in his gospel. So tune into that. We'll dig in a little deeper to, to see what the significance is of that pretty profound event for us in our lives yet today. So with that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you join me? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise, honor and glory for the God you are. A God of grace, a God of love, a God of light, and a God of life. And Lord, you know what we have brought into this time of worship, carrying on our hearts and on our minds. And we put these matters, these people, and ourselves into your hands praying that you would speak to us through your word today. With that confidence, we commend our time together now into your hands as well, praying all of this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we begin with our invocation and call to worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Beyond our busyness, above the cold winter floor, there is a glory rising, born of heaven, and reaching out to each one of us. Transforming darkness into hope, bringing life from a cross. In glory, Jesus meets us here, raising us from the depths of the valley to the height of the mountain. Let us worship from the mountain and hear again.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, first in the quiet of our hearts, and then together in the spoken confession. Holy and glorious God, even with you at work in our lives, we confess that we too often side with the ways of the world rather than using your power to shine your light into the darkness. Your word brings us life and light, yet we can find ourselves living in darkness and dread. Forgive us, Lord. Give us the strength and power we need to live in the light of your love. Hear the good news of the psalmist's proclamation. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the night around me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to God, and the night is as bright as the day. The God who promised never to leave us or forsake us has come to us in Jesus Christ, who binds up the brokenhearted, heals all our infirmities, and forgives all our sins. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated as we hear from God in his word. The Old Testament The Old Testament reading this morning is from Exodus uh, chapter 24. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like, like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. 
we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin, origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And if I could have the children come on forward for this morning's children's message. Any parents or adults want to join, you're welcome to come up as well. You're going to want these. You're going to want these. Okay. So we are going to act out the transfiguration of our Lord this morning. So Hunter is going to be Jesus. Come on up, Hunter. And I need you to hold this and then spin around for me a bunch. Keep going, keep going, keep going. All right. Shiloh, will you kill the lights? So, during the transfiguration, Jesus glowed like Hunter did in these lights. And the disciples were amazed. Garrett, can you say, I'm so amazed? I'm, say it again. Thanks, You're so amazed that Jesus would glow. And so in the transfiguration, we see Jesus's divinity. Do you know what that means, Hunter? That Jesus's divinity, do you know that word? So it means that we saw that Jesus was truly God, that he had the power of God, that he was shining so bright that the people could not even look at him because they would be blinded. That's why Garrett's got his sunglasses on right now. And so we're reminded that in the transfiguration, we see Jesus' divinity. You're not blinded because you've got him. You're right. And so we're reminded that Jesus is the Son of God. And as we enter into next week where we start Lent, we're going to see a totally different side of Jesus where we see his humanity and how we see that he died on the cross for us because he loves us so much. But this week we're focusing on seeing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he has power, that he has might, that he is amazing because he is God's Son that God loves so incredibly much. And so the disciples got to see this and we get to read about it and we get to know that Jesus is the Son of God and that he loves us so incredibly much. So we're going to pray and thank God that he has sent Jesus for us. So do you want to fold your hands, bow your heads, and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you so much 
for sending Jesus to this earth to be the Son of God. Help us to remember that you love us and always take care of us. Amen. All right, I come in the back with me. <laughs> thank you, Miss Martha, and thank you, Hunter, for glowing today. So we're heading up the mountain today. We're heading up the mountain to be with Jesus and with Peter, James, and John to help us step into maybe a little bit, at least thinking about what they may have experienced, I want us to take a moment right off the bat to consider some of the mountaintop experiences that you have had. So I want you to think about those mountaintop experiences, and as always, if you're comfortable, feel free to, to talk and share with the people that you're sitting around. But what I really want to hear about is what is it that makes those particular experiences mountaintop experiences? All right? So take a moment, if you would. Think about that. Talk as you're comfortable. All right, I don't want to hear about the experiences themselves, but if you could, or a few of you could, share in a somewhat brief, succinct way, what is it that makes the experiences that we have mountaintop experiences? Anybody? What is it? Jim? Okay, that sense that God is doing this, that God is in it, that evidence that he's a part of something. All right, good, what else? And they don't necessarily have to be spiritual experiences, but just mountaintop things. Mary? Nice, so this overwhelming clarity and calmness in those moments all right what else mark all right so that sense no matter how big your experience was it, it allows you some perspective to, to realize how vast a place we're in the midst of, what God has created, what God has put us in, and that sense of awe again. Good? Any others? Bill? Bill? Okay, that God is near. That he's right there with you. Good, I appreciate that. And, and as we think about these mountaintop experiences, let's head there. Because this 
transfiguration event was one of those, whoa, wow, I can't imagine kind of experiences. And between Jesus' face shining like the sun, his clothes glowing like Christmas lights, perhaps, from Hunter today, Moses and Elijah showing up. This cloud, a bright cloud enveloping them and the booming voice of the Father. That had to have been what I think we could all consider the ultimate mountaintop experience. Or as we've been going along throughout this Winter Epiphany series, that that was epiphanization at its very best. Now, epiphanization as we've been, or being epiphanized as we've been talking about these seven weeks of this series, is very simply shining light into dark places. Specifically, that we shine Jesus' light, His love that fills our hearts, our minds, our lives, that we let that shine wherever we are, into all sorts of dark places, shining for people that we interact with day in and day out, for them to see the true light, the real light. Now, Peter was one of only three disciples that got this special invitation from Jesus to go up on this particular mountain on this particular day. Jesus knew exactly what was coming. He knew what was going to be happening. The three disciples had no idea. They were just following Jesus and ended up getting blown away with what they ultimately experienced on that mountaintop. The fact that Peter was an eyewitness to this mysterious, miraculous, jaw-dropping, bright light shining event is actually pretty significant. Now in our second reading for today, which was Peter's second letter that we have, he says explicitly several times. He says in verse 16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And again in verse 18, that we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. This isn't some secondhand story. This isn't gossip that's just being spread around. And it's not, even as Peter himself said here, it, this, these are not cleverly devised stories. No. Peter was there. And he is reporting sharing exactly what he saw and what he heard, which was exactly what the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them, recorded in their own gospel accounts in the exact same way. Now, why is this so important? Why take time to, to drill down in this? Well, because what Peter shares with us here brings to light some very important things when it comes to our faith and our following of Jesus. This transfiguration event, it was all about Jesus. All about Jesus. It wasn't about the disciples. It wasn't about Moses and Elijah. It was about Jesus and letting his glory shine. And the glimpse of his glory that Peter, James, and John got, all of that, as Martha shared with us in the children's message, was really affirmation. The certainty of who we know Jesus to be. And Peter tells us that it wasn't just this generic voice, but it was God the Father who spoke out of this cloud when he said, 
This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then when Peter went on to say, here in verse 19 of his letter, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. What he was doing there when he made that statement was affirming this equally significant testimony. You see, it wasn't just that he and James and John were there and that they did hear with their own ears and saw with their own eyes everything that happened. But with this statement, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Peter was saying, God has given to all of us an equally significant testimony. This word from the prophets that he has given to us throughout the entire Bible. This is God's voice continuing to speak into our world, into our lives, and to all of us today. And what did Peter go on to say about this completely reliable prophetic message? He said, you'll do well to pay attention to it. You'll do well to pay attention to it. And that's exactly what he heard from God the Father. Speaking out of that cloud, when the Father said, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying. Pay attention to what I'm saying to you. And where this takes us is, is to a place, really, that I think many of us would think too basic, too simple. And, and why am I even bothering to talk about this? Because where this takes us is something that I have to say. It takes us right back to the Bible. It takes us right back to what we believe and know to be God's word, a word of truth that is reliable, that is trustworthy, that we do well to pay attention to. And I almost hate saying this, but there are far too many churches and far too many pastors across our country who don't even use the Bible in worship. They don't read the Bible in worship. There may be a phrase in a prayer or a verse or two used in a sermon. But I share this because what we have here is something that we can very easily take for granted, which is not a bad thing. But we need to know that this is not necessarily the norm across our country. And even worse is that there are far too many churches and pastors who don't believe that this is true. Who don't believe everything in here is reliable or happened or that we can look to or count on. But we do. We have to. And just what we're given here today from Peter, what we understand the Bible to be, truly is the Word of God. What God has given to us in an equally mysterious way. And we hold to what Peter had to say when he said this, verses 20 and 21. He said, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things for prophecy never had its origin in the human will but prophets though human spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit we believe that 
do we fully understand how God did it? How he carried these prophets along, gave them his words to speak and to write? Not exactly. But that truly does form the basis of our faith. What we hold to, what we know and believe to be true. It's this that gives us direction to our lives. It gives us truth, real truth, life-changing truth. And it's a testimony not only of the prophets and the apostles and what God inspired them to record for us from God, but I know I, and I am guessing many of you, have seen the power of God's Word at work in the hearts and lives, maybe of yourself, but of other people as well. It has been affirmed that, that this Word of God is real truth. Truth that we can stand on. Truth that we can live by. It is light. A light shining into the darkness a darkness that we experience for ourselves a darkness that we see all around us and that leads us to another very basic truth one that i have been speaking about over the last number of weeks and that is this word of truth god's word the bible where does it point us where does it point us tell me to Jesus always to Jesus only to Jesus over and over again from beginning to end it shows us Jesus and so we listen to him we pay attention to his word and with that in mind let's head back to the mountaintop for one more thing this mountaintop experience for Peter, James, and John had to be absolutely unbelievable, even surreal, if we can put ourselves up there. Now, they appeared to be doing pretty good through most of this, through seeing Jesus' face and clothes glow with the brightness of the sun, seeing Moses and Elijah showing up, which I'm not going to travel down this road, but how they know it was Moses and Elijah? You know, Name tag. Hello, my name is. <laughs> I don't know. But they knew it was Moses and Elijah. But when that bright cloud enveloped them and that booming voice of God the Father spoke, that pushed them over the edge. And we're told when the disciples heard this, the Father's voice, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Now, while you and I may not be terrified from the voice of God speaking out of a cloud that I'm guessing not many of us have experienced, and in all likelihood we will not in the course of our lifetime, but there are plenty of things that can and do terrify us. I want us to pause one more time here this morning and give that a little bit of thought. <clears throat> What are those things in your life, in our world, that can scare you, terrify you, cause you to be afraid? Take a moment, if you would. Again, think about that. If you're comfortable talking, have some conversation. All right, this one doesn't take a lot of time. I mean, there's so much out there, right? Share with me again, just brief things, words, phrases. What are things that, that can and maybe do scare us, terrify us, cause us to be anxious? What's out there or what's in here? Mary? 
health issues. What else? Jerry. Okay, our society has turned the, the view of good into evil, and I'll say the vice versa, has turned the view of evil into good. Okay, Greg? Yeah, the increasing power of God's enemies that they seem to have that in all appearances, what we're seeing and hearing going on all around us seems to be growing. And that's scary. What else? It scares us, terrifies us, causes us to be anxious. Pat? Oh, I'll come back. Pat? Yeah, so many of your descendants, so many of your, your family don't know the Lord. That's terrifying. Scary. Yeah. Peggy? Yeah, fear for your grandchildren or for our kids and, and the world that they're growing up in, all that they have to face, all the things that they're up against is scary. Elizabeth? Yeah, the increased amount of natural disasters that going on, and they're huge, and they're scary. I mean, there is a lot, isn't there? And there's a lot more we could talk about, a lot more I'm guessing you talked or thought about, whether it's, Mary, you mentioned health, we can think finances, our economy, our government. I mean, there are plenty of things all around us and these things are real. And they can be scary. Now, some of these things are actually inside of us. Our own sinfulness. Our own brokenness. I mean, that's a reality. We're not perfect. In Christ, we are made perfect. And yet, it's that tension that we live in the day-to-day -day of, of our lives on this side of eternity still struggling with that sinful human nature that tugs at us, that pulls us in directions that, that are contrary to God's truth, God's ways. And there's also plenty outside of us and all around us that are very real evidence of, of the brokenness and of the sinfulness with which we are living. Now, please hear this. Hear this. Jesus knows. He knows everything that's going on. And just like on that mountaintop, he saw how scared his friends were. And know that the same continues to be true for us. He looks, he knows. He sees those times when you and I get scared. And his message is still the same. That hasn't changed at all. He went up to his friends and said, get up. Don't be afraid. He touched them. He continues to do that for us yet today. Hear these words, not as a scolding for being afraid, but hear it in this sense. As Jesus reaches down in our fears or anxiousness or concerns, and feel his touch and hear his words. Get up. You don't have have to be afraid. I'm here. I'm with you. I love you. Listen to me. Trust me. From this mountaintop, Jesus would be heading straight to the cross. And 
we're starting that new season of Lent on Wednesday that's going to take us on that same journey, headed straight to the cross of Good Friday. And we know that it is on that cross that Jesus would deal once and for all with all of our sin, with all of our brokenness, with all the darkness in this world that can frighten us or unnerve us. And by way of His cross and His resurrection from the dead, He shines light. He brings forgiveness. He shows His grace. He reminds us of His love. So listen to Him, friends. Listen to Jesus. Pay attention to what He has to say. In those times of, of fear or concern or anxiousness, feel His touch. Hear His words. Get up. You don't have to be afraid. I'm here. The what now that we have for today. If you want to grab your insert, uh, the Bring It Home insert, it's also up on the screen. Uh, it's a long one, but it ties us into uh, the season that we're coming into. With the season of Lent starting on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, determined to be more diligent and intentional when it comes to listening to Jesus. Striving to be in worship every week, taking advantage of the midweek Lent worship services, reading the Bible, having devotion time every day, and being in prayer daily. Ask the Lord for His help and for Him to open your ears and your heart to listen and hear Him clearly with all matters before you in your life. Amen. And that peace of God, a peace that at times goes beyond our understanding, let it guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus today and always. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we join in confessing our faith using one of our ancient creeds. 
This morning we used the Nicene Creed, these words drawn from the truth of God's own word, a word that followers of Jesus have continued to confess and speak boldly in all times, professing this faith to which we hold in all of its simplicity and in all of its mystery. And so again this morning we have that privilege of joining our voices with those gone before us to speak with that same boldness, with that same courage, with that same confidence, the faith which we hold today. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for our time of offering. A time of offering has always been a part of the worship of God's people. It's not a time for guilt. It's not a time for arm twisting. It's not a time for begging for more money. But it's a time to pause in the midst of our worship, to reflect on who God is, to reflect on all that he has given. And our offerings, whether they are left out in the baskets in the atrium or given through our uh, website or through the app or through texting, it all serves the same purpose. It allows us to say a simple thank you to God, to acknowledge him as the giver of all that we are and all that we have. So let's join together in uh, reiterating, remembering some of the many promises God gives to us throughout his word when it comes to the blessing and the gift of giving. Friends in Christ, know that all we have, all we are, and all we do is a gift from God. God doesn't need our gifts, but he knows that life is better when we share generously from all that we have of our time, talents, and treasures. As we give our offerings, a tenth or so, we're giving thanks to God for his abundant gifts to us. Glorious God, thank you for revealing yourself to us. May we use the gifts given us to share your love with others. Amen. In our prayers today, we've got a number of requests that we want to include, and those are for Vern Raby's family, a particular her adult children, Bruce and Jane, as they prepare for Vern's memorial service. That will be tomorrow morning at Good Samaritan at 10 o'clock. For Ronnie Gray's nephew, whose wife passed away from cancer, her memorial service was last weekend in Johnstown. For Pat Freisinger's daughter, Lou, and her husband, Curtis. Uh, Curtis is very near death right now. Uh, prayers for peace and comfort for all those who are dealing with death of loved ones. For Sally Smeeting's Aunt Peggy in Colorado Springs, she's 90 years old, and is dealing with some pretty serious health issues. 
for Anna Rehnquist's dad, who it appears may have had his cancer return, prayers that it hasn't, and for guidance in these days. For Nancy Whitfield's lifelong friend in South Carolina, who had major surgery earlier this week. For Ron and Leslie Husingfeld's great nephew, who's been dealing with a serious infection. For Alex Schnegelberger's good friend who was involved in a fatal accident, prayers of thanks that she survived and seems to be doing okay. For Jim and Sandy Peterson, both recovering from COVID. And for Jim, who went to the ER yesterday morning with some possible heart issues, uh, thankfully his home seems to be doing okay. We pray for Sean York, who, had, who has hand surgery scheduled for tomorrow. For Ellen Zurcher's niece, who had a heart attack, surgery is scheduled for Tuesday. Prayers of thanks for Judy Robertson's miraculous recovery from surgery after having suffered an aneurysm, uh, which her doctor says only 4 to 5% of people survive, so we are grateful for her life. Prayers for Judy's husband, Gary, who fell while he was leaving the hospital to visit Judy. Uh, prayers of thanks, he was not seriously injured. For Colton Kindred's successful adenoid surgery. For Joe Rubel's successful surgery down in Georgia following a fall. For Sandy Pratt's uh, recovery process from knee surgery, prayers of thanks, that is going so well. And prayers of thanks for Pastor Robin and Vicki Dougal's close friend Linda following her successful open heart surgery. For our country and world, uh, so much darkness. Uh, Hunter mentioned the natural disasters, so many that are going on that people are continuing to pick up after, as well as the many man-made disasters, the evil that we see all around us, the shooting at Michigan State University, other shootings that continue to make the news and the headlines. We pray for our country and for our world. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are a God of light and of life, a God of love and grace. And so we come to you today. Uh, we lift up many of these people that we have mentioned who are dealing with loss, with difficulties, challenges, medical issues, and so much more. And not only these, Lord, but we lift up to you many others that uh, we have carried into this time of worship today on our hearts and our minds people dealing with all manner of things that, that we're aware of. Lord, we know you. We know your heart. We know your love. And you know us. Help us to listen to you. Help us to trust you. We know that you are fully aware of all the things going on in our lives, in our world, and you are here with us. For that, we are grateful. And as you've invited us, we pray. We pray for healing. We pray for help. We pray for comfort, peace. And we pray that you would provide what you know is needed most in each and every one of these situations. Lord, for the thankfulness, the joys, the recoveries from surgery, successful surgeries, birthdays, anniversaries, life, love. Lord, these flow from your heart and from your hand. And for that, we are so grateful. So in all these matters, Lord, we pray that your will would be done and your grace would abound. Lord, in your mercy. For this ministry of yours here at Emmanuel, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve together here in this place and time. And I pray that you would help us in everything that we are and everything that we do, from every activity, event, ongoing ministry, for every small group, Bible study, Help us to keep Jesus first and foremost, front and center. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we hear the words, listen to him. Help us to do that. Help us to have ears and hearts that are open. Help us to share what we do through, through our teaching, through our fellowship times, through the formal and informal, planned and unplanned, to put Jesus forward, to shine his light and his love. Lord, in your mercy. 
And for this world of ours, Lord, there is so much heartache, so much hurt, so much darkness. From the natural disasters to the man-made evils and disasters that we experience and hear of, we pray that you would make your presence known. Use us as your people in these times and places to be feet on the ground, to offer help and resources as we are able, to show that belief and faith and trust in you and following you is not just a club event, but it's a reality of life and the hope that we carry. So we pray for President Biden and other world leaders who carry a heavy burden. We pray for all those elected and appointed throughout every level of our government. Guide and direct them in, in your ways to govern wisely and well. Shift them from their own agendas, their own desires. Help them to listen to you and stand on your word of truth and to govern off that solid foundation. We pray for all those who serve on our many front lines, for those serving in healthcare professions, law enforcement, firefighters, first responders, and those serving our armed forces here and around the world. Thank you for all these men and women willing to put themselves in harm's way for us, for our health, our safety, and our well-being, and for the freedoms that we enjoy. Protect them, guard them, help them too to listen to you and be attuned to your truth, your words, your help. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as many of you know, most every week here at Emmanuel. And we do this, too, not out of empty ritual or tradition or simply habit, but it's here where the light shines brightest. It is here that we gather at the Lord's table at His invitation to receive from Him what He knows we need. His love, His forgiveness, His strength and power to be the epiphanized people of God that we have been called and claimed to be. So our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. If there are any of you here today wondering whether or not you should come and receive the Lord's Supper, would you ask yourself these four questions? First, do you know Jesus? Do you believe in Him, trust in Him as Lord and Savior? Second, do you acknowledge the sin and brokenness in your own heart and in your own life and desire to receive the healing and the forgiveness that the Lord offers here? Third, do you believe our Lord's words, profound, mysterious words that go beyond our ability to explain or, or understand it. But do you believe it to be true that what we receive today is bread and wine? And it's also Jesus' very body and blood. And finally, fourth, would it be your intention with the Holy Spirit at work in your heart that you would look for those opportunities to shine His light, to share His love? If you answered yes to these questions, this gift is for you. We'll have two serving stations on either end of the communion rail. Simply follow the direction of the ushers. Children and young people not yet instructed in the Lord's Supper, you're invited to come for a blessing. Or if there are adults here today who would prefer simply to receive a blessing, please come with your hands folded to indicate that. Otherwise, have your hands cupped to receive the bread.
My friends, the table is ready, and the peace of the Lord be with you always.
invite all who are able to please stand. In the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in true faith, now and for life everlasting. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. If you'd have a seat for just a moment longer, thank you once again for joining together, both here and in person, and I pray that our time together was an encouragement, strengthening for us, each of us, in our faith, and that reminder of how critical it is that we keep listening to what our Lord has to say. By way of announcements, a handful of things I want to share with you this morning. First of all, Pastor Al has a 90th birthday coming up here at the end of the month. <laughs> Next Sunday, between services in the West Atrium, we're going to have cake for him, and uh, we're going to make you kind of hang out over there. I know you've got duties with the Ask a Pastor, but yeah, we'll pull you away from that next week. So that'll be next week between services, West Atrium. Enjoy some cake and some well wishes for Pastor Al. Starting next Sunday is my next Emmanuel 101 class, and that is a class for anyone who wants to know more about who we are, what we believe, what we teach, and I uh, encourage you to come be a part of that, or if you know of someone who may be interested in that, let me know, and I'd be happy to pass on specific information of where we're meeting and all of what that class is going to entail. Martha has got summer stuff out, and that's on a table to the right in the atrium. That's going to be rather fluid, so I encourage you to keep checking back. Marcus is going to be adding to that as well as far as some of the, the youth things, but lots of children, lots of youth activities, ministries that are coming up that we need to be getting ready for already that we're looking ahead for this summer. So check that out when you have an opportunity. And finally, uh, season of Lent begins this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. And I mentioned in my email updates the last couple from this past week that we are doing something brand new this year. We're going to be offering the imposition of ashes from 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. That, in spite of the frigid temperatures, I will be out there and will uh, provide for you if you're on your way to work or want to start the day with that. Uh, if you want to stay in your car, you are welcome to do that. Or if you want to come in, Pastor Robin gets the cushy job because he's older than me. <clears throat> He'll be here providing that. But encourage you to take advantage. We are, <clears throat> excuse me, we will have our worship services offering both the imposition of ashes and the Lord's Supper. That'll be Wednesday at 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock. And we've got printed devotional materials. I've been talking about this for a few weeks now for adults. And Miss Martha has some things for families with children. Those are on a table in the atrium. I encourage you to grab those. They're also available online. Uh, email updates this week are going to be Tuesday and Thursday with the holiday. On Monday, offices are closed. But there are lots and lots of information that's included in those updates if you are not on that email group but would like to be hearing all the things that have happened, all the ways that you can be a part of things coming up, stop at the information station just to the left out in the atrium, grab a welcome card, give me your email address, your name, we'll get you added to that email group. Now on Ash Wednesday, we're beginning our new series entitled Honest Repentance. 
going to be a powerful series. And uh, that's going to start Ash Wednesday. We'll continue then the following Sunday as we look at various aspects of being honest, being honest with ourselves, being honest with God, being honest with one another, and the power that that brings to our daily living. So I hope you can join me. Until then, go in peace. Serve the Lord.